Um, today, Scott will tell us about how to run the modern UM versions. Um, and with that, I'll just pass it out over to Scott. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Holger. Um, so I'm going to be fairly casual in this, just going over um, how to use the model. Um, if you've got any questions or anything, feel free to ask. Um, I'm not sure how much experience you all have with the model. Um, but so the, the, the basic background of the unified model is it was developed by the UK's Met Office in sort of the 1980s, 1990s. So it's a, it's a fairly old model, um, but it's been continuously developed over that time. Um, it's an atmospheric model um, used for both weather prediction and climate research. Um, there's a bunch of uh, weather institutions using it for NWP, numerical weather prediction. Um, we've got the UK Met Office, the Bureau in Australia, um, the Indian Met Agency, uh, New Zealand, NIWA uses it. Um, and Korea has been using it, but I think they're starting to transition off it. Um, so it's, it's widely used and sort of the big claim to fame of the model is that the science configurations are supposed to be scale invariant. So that means you can run like a high resolution, resolution limited area model using the same science set, science settings as like a low resolution global model. And you'll have that um, continuity there. Um, so like unlike WARF, which only does regional runs, uh, the UM can do global or limited area runs uh, using uh, one-way nesting. Uh, so for like regional runs, we've got a setup where you basically plug in the location that you're wanting to run it. And then it sets up all of the um, data that you need to run the model. So like boundary conditions and stuff um, from error five or like that, some other global run. Um, so to start off with, there's a couple resources that are useful for working with the model. If I share my screen. Um, so this is our CMS wiki. Um, so it's got a, a bunch of different inf information about data and models and stuff. Um, so in the unified model section, um, we've got all information on how to get started and setting up your um, user account. Um, tips for running things, links, uh, different model experiments you can run, um, common errors, what to do with the input and output, um, if you're going to modify the UM, um, how to go about that if you're wanting to add your own science. And the other big resource is the Met Office um, MOSRS website. This is where the model is actually developed. Um, so you can request an account, just email the CMS help desk and we can set you up with an account. And they've got sections on say the model. If we go into here, it'll have um, the current version. So they release new versions of the model every few months, I think it's about three versions a year. Um, and there's also the model documentation, which can be helpful to look at. Um, it's split up into a bunch of different papers on the different science sections. And if you're looking at like aerosols or radiation, um, there'll be more information about what the model's doing in all of these. Uh, 
Um, so in addition to the model documentation, um, we've also got science documentation. Um, so when you're running the model, you'll use a specific version of the model source code and a specific version of the science settings. Um, so science settings from the Met Office, uh, normally global atmosphere will be like it says, global models running over the atmosphere. And they've got documentation on all of their different versions of that here. So you can go in and see what the difference are differences are between the different versions. Um, so these will be continuously developed over a few years. So you can he see here GA7 has been running from UM version 10.3 to um, pretty much the current version. So this is the most recent stable version of the science settings. And they're in the pro process of assessing how well um, GA8, so Global Atmosphere 8, is performing. Um, so it has been frozen and then we should have stable releases sometime soon once they're happy with all of the science settings. Similarly for regional models, um, they've got regional configurations. So this is where the limited area runs are defined. Um, here you've got the RA for regional atmosphere um, science settings. Um, just like the global settings, they evolve these over years. Um, so that's the Met Office stuff. Um, generally, if you're wanting to contribute science changes back to the Met Office, you'd want to be running one of the Met Office experiments at as recent a model version as you can get. Um, the other option is the access experiments. So this is, these are what people would normally use within the center and the Australian research community, because that lets you um, compare your results against the published um, CMIP6 experiments. So AXIS is the Australian Community Climate and Earth System Simulator. It comes in a couple things. It's, it's, it's different combinations of the UM atmosphere, the cable land surface, um, and the MOM ocean. So it can be run in a coupled model with all of these uh, different bits talking to it, talking to each other, um, or it can be run in standalone versions. So you could have just the atmosphere part of access, um, or you could just have the ocean part, or just run cable on its own. Um, so yeah, um, coupled runs. Coupled runs are much more expensive than atmosphere only runs. Um, so especially for access CM2, which includes atmospheric chemistry. Um, so access CM2 is sort of the, the most expensive, highest performance one. ESM 1.5 is the other CMIP6 generation model, um, that's been run by CSIRO and within the center, it's much cheaper um to run um, but it uses a much older version of the atmosphere so it uses um 7.3 which is the same version that was used for cmip 5 so it's only a bit extra a bit more modern than the cmip 5 era models um, running the coupled model uh, is a bit different to running the standalone atmosphere um, so for the moment, I'm planning to just show the standalone atmosphere. Um, but if people are interested, um, we can talk about that later. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at running a model. So if I grab my terminal, um, 
We run the unified model by first logging onto a server at NCI called Access Dev. Um, so I've already logged on here. Um, this is just a, a common place for everyone to store their model configurations and then start up the GUI. Um, so you'll find lots of people use this from across CSIRO and the Bureau research as well as the center researchers. Um, if we want to run a UM job, uh, we've got a tool called ROSI, which is basically the experiment directory. So I can go ROSI go, and this should pop up once it picks for a bit, a list of all of the experiments that people have run that you can search through. Um, a lot of these won't be runnable as is at NCI um, because they'll be models that are set up to run in the UK or in New Zealand or whatever. Um, we've got a list on the CMS wiki of jobs that are already set up to be able to run at NCI. Um, nothing's popping up, it's a pain. Um, but anyway, that shows you a list of all of the experiments. Um, the other thing we can do is we can, if we know the identity of a job, so the job ID number, uh, we can do a rosy copy on the command line. So if I want to copy job U um, CE355, which is a UM 11.6 GA 7.1 job. So then again, that's the model version, science version. Um, I can run that here on just on the command line without having to open up um, any uh, graphical interface. So here we can put in some metadata and create a copy. So I've already got this checked out, so I'm not going to, um, but that was be how you um, download an experiment configuration. Once you've downloaded them, um, they go into a directory called roses and then the job ID just by default. And here we've got the experiment configuration. Um, so most of this is just like text files uh, used to generate the name lists for the model. Um, and there's a editor for the name lists. I mean, you can go into say app um rosapp.conf. These are just text files and you can edit the um, name list settings directly or you can do rows edit. We'll bring up the graphical editor. So hopefully this works better than the experiment list and yes it seems it has. Um, so this is the editor for setting up the experiment. So for a unified model experiment, access CM2 looks very similar to this. Um, and the limited area runs uses use the same interface. Um, if you're wanting to run access ESM, then that works differently. Um, how this works is we've got a bunch of different sections on the left we can go through. So we can say we're running at NCI using the normal queue set up science configurations, resolutions. Uh, resolution numbers is roughly double this number around the equator. So N96 would be 192 points around the equator. And similarly for the other ones. Um, you can set up your start dates, um, run lengths. Uh, the model will automatically say run one month at a time 
They're just in sections until it gets to the target total run length. So this will run uh, month, what's that, September of 1988, and then it will run October of 1988, and then it will finish. Then you've got things like setting up the number of processes. Generally for the experiments that we've set up that are listed on the wiki, um, all of this will be good to go. It'll be set to uh, a, a pretty efficient uh, number of processes. And we do have some information on the uh, resources needed to run the model. Um, then we've got the tasks that the model will run. So these just turn on and off. Uh, you've got building the model from source code. Um, obviously you only need to do this once because once it's built, it will be there for future runs. So in, so once you've run this once, you can turn that off fine. Uh, reconfiguration. Reconfiguration is setting up the model initial conditions. So if you've got some uh, start dump from another model run, the reconfiguration or will check that start dump make sure that the dates are correct, make sure that the land mask is correct. If you're not changing the sea surface temperature or anything, uh, any static data that's in a atmosphere only run, that will be set up in, in the reconfiguration. Um, so yeah, th this is important to run if you're doing any major changes to the model science. Um, just to make sure that all of the fields that are required are present. Um, and then running the model, just like it says, runs the model. Uh, the rest of these things, most of them don't work at NCI. There's stuff that's been set up at the med office. Um, so med office people will set, run the post-processing to do their custom post-processing and save it to um, save it to their archives. So we don't necessarily have all of that set up. Um, if there's a particular interest in having some of this set up, uh, you can always talk to us. Um, so this is the sort of general configuration for the run. Um, then you've got settings for building the model. Um, so here, this is setting up that um, model source version. Um, if you're doing stuff, so dual UM is, is the unified model. So that's the atmosphere part. Um, the UK have their own land surface model called Jules, which is included in GA configurations. Um, Socrates is radiation. Uh, Cassium, I don't know what it is. Um, you can click on these and it can tell you. Um, so if I click on this, this pops up um, and it doesn't tell us what Cassium is, but you can get help on any of these settings. So generally you won't need to touch these um, unless you're like developing the model yourself, if you're adding in your own code. Um, again, stuff like this is pretty fine to leave as is. Um, the one thing you might want to change is branches. Um, so if, so when you develop science changes, you create a branch that gets added to uh, the model source code. And so if you're wanting to reproduce someone else's science settings and they've made a branch for their science um, setup, you would add that here and build in the model. Um, you can see this one is already set up with a branch to fix reinitialization in presumably that's a Gregorian calendar thing. Um, the Met Office like to run their models with a 360 day calendar. 
uh, which can be a pain if you're trying to match it up with other data sets. Um, access experiments will normally use a Gregorian calendar um, that is switchable um, later on in the UM science settings, which I guess we'll get to next. So if we go down here to the UM name lists, uh, we can do things like editing the site settings and editing the uh, name lists. Uh, so you've got a couple things here, like running with a coupler. Most of these are not too important. I'm just checking to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, you can say how verbose you want the logs are logs to be. If you're running for a really long time, if you're running for like a hundred years, um, it's a good idea to only put minimum logging information because otherwise your directory will just get filled up with log files. Um, if you run into a crash, uh, you can turn up the logging information so, so that you see what's happening. And we've got our name lists. Um, most of these settings, again, will stay as is. Um, so this has already been set up for you to run that um, GA 7.1 science settings. Um, but we've got things like the number of steps in a day. Um, so it's 72 steps per day. Um, here it's saying use a 360 day calendar. Um, these little things here are options that you can enable. So you can enable an optional configuration for a Gregorian calendar, if you like, and that will set all the settings that's needed to run with Gregorian. Um, you probably do that somewhere up here. Here. So this setting here would chat would enable all of those Gregorian settings globally um, throughout the configuration. Um, another thing you can do is search. So if I just type Gregorian, it should search. I might just do configurations. This is searching through uh, through the configuration, just the nameless names. So just these ones, I'm not sure what it found here. Um, yeah, maybe that's less useful than I thought. Um, so that's all general stuff, reconfiguration. Um, this is saying if you're starting from a UM file or from a GRIB file, say if you wanted to start from error five initial conditions, you could use a GRIB file to um, start that. So that's just a different file format like NetCDF. Um, we've got some general science settings. Um, if you're changing resolution, so if your initial conditions are a different um, resolution to what you're wanting to, wanting to run the model from, um, we can horizontally or vertically interpolate to different model levels. Um, and the next big thing would be ancillaries. So ancillaries are things for uh, static data files. So like a climatology, um, stuff that isn't generated by the model, but is needed by the model. So here we've got ozone information, river information, uh, orography, so our surface terrain, sea ice, vegetation, more rivers, SSTs, soil data, land sea mask, so none of these are interactively computed by the model. You just have to feed in what the model's going to use. So it reads these in from a file. Um, there's a special format for this and there's tools for generating that format from NetCDF files. Um, there's more information on our wiki. 
So if you're wanting to give it your give the model your own land C mask or different SSTs, stuff like that. Um, and these can be, if we go into one of these files, it's not very helpfully named, but you can match up the index here. So C5, if we're going to look at the mask. So we're reading in the mask over the whole grid, initializing from an ancillary file. Um, you can also update it. So update, it reads from the file, new data every month. So if you've got a monthly climatology for your SST and you're wanting to update it once a month, you can do that here. Um, probably if we search for here, we'll find one of those. Just initializing. Here we go. So here we're updating for our fields for LAI and canopy height. So these are land surface information. We're reading data from the file every five days. Um, so you can change the frequency here. If the data isn't that frequent within the file, so if you've only got monthly data and you're trying to read it from five days, that's fine. It will do a linear interpolation between your uh, the times in the file to work out what it would be at five days. Okay, so then we've got Scott. Yes, Claire. I actually have a question on sure. one like um. So here it says like it's going to read every five days. But then after at the source, it says set to missing data. So is it reading or is it setting to missing data? Yeah, um, so there, we've got two sections here. So source is what happens in the reconfiguration. So at that first pre-processing step, so it's gonna set the, set the field from that to missing data. And then if we're set updating, that happens within the model run itself. So at time step zero, it's going to, the, the restart file is going to be set to miss, missing data. And then the model at time step zero is going to go into uh, this file and work out and read in what the variable values will be at that time step. Um, so this is just like a safety thing in case you forget to read it, update the data from a file, it'll make the model crash. Um, if the data in here isn't good. Yeah. Uh, it's not important. Uh, model input and output would be sort of the, the next big section. So we've gone through our model inputs, uh, model outputs. So what variables we want to get out of the model the model includes its own like post-processing system. So you can get like averages over space or time, um, mins and max. So if you wanted to create, get the monthly minimum of your temperature field and stuff, uh, the model can compute all of those online. So you don't have to save extra data. Um, so we've got things like dumping and meaning is mostly restart dump stuff. So this is saying what the file name will be for our restart dump. Um, data M is, we'll get to that, that's basically just our output directory. Um, and save it with a run ID and then a dot D path and then the this extra percent stuff will just be a timestamp. So here we've got regular frequency dumps every 10 days. Um, and we've also got meaning turned on. So it will automatically create means from the, from the restart dumps. This is saying it's going to create every three dump frequencies for the first one. 
So every three times 10 days, so every 30 days, your 360 day calendar, that's once a month. So you'll have a monthly file, three times that would be a seasonal file, four times that'll be a yearly file, and 10 times that'll be a decadal file. Um, whether or not these are useful to you will depend on your use case. Um, and then this is saying the file names for that monthly, seasonal, yearly, and decadal output files. Um, if you don't care about these, you can turn these all to zero. We'll not do that meaning. Um, so that's a, a special type of output for the means. Uh, general output will go into these model output streams. So we might have all of our daily variables are being written to file PP0 which has a .pa suffix and all of our three hourly maximums are going into the PB stream and all of our monthly fields are going into the PK stream. So these are these different files just that you organize your outputs um, just so there's not like zillions of them in a single file, um, especially for um, for stuff like CMIP runs where you've just got enormous amounts of variables being saved, that can be really helpful. Um, the model does have in recent versions, some support for NetCDF. Um, we've not used it much, um, but by default, the model will save into its own format files. And then you do a, do a conversion after that. Um, because this is so new, we've not really tested it out too much. And then this stash request thing is the actual variables that you're wanting to output. So if we go into here, the stash requests, we've got a big table of all of the variable names and then what's going to happen to those variables. So here we've got our wind u so after the time step uh, domain is your spatial domain so here we're running we're going to save all row levels um, diag is normally surface levels um, th would be theta levels uh, the model has a offset uh, vertical grid so you'll have uh, row levels, one, two, three, and in between those, there'll be theta levels. Different variables are on different level types. Um, check the model documentation for that. This is mainly just for numerical stability um, reasons. Okay, so we've got our spatial domain. Uh, you can also just get a like a region of data if you only care about a region. Um, we've then got a time. So this is temporal processing. So this is like six hourly samples, monthly mean, I would guess. Uh, this would be a mean over the dump. So that's the mean files we were looking at before, our, our monthly, seasonal, so forth means. Um, would be the dump mean, We've got daily means, uh, 90 day values, stuff like that. And then this is the file they're going into. So um, up G will be one of our files. That will probably be the .pg file. So we're saving all row levels, the six hourly monthly mean to file G. And we've got that for all of the variables that we're wanting to save. Um, you can see by default, there is a massive amount of variables. 
Yes, Claire. What if you update this and in the file it goes in, you update it to a wrong file and you get with two variables with different output frequency going to the same file? Um, that will normally be handled by the conversion script. Um, they'll be saved to uh, variables. One will have a, like a one suffix or something. So the UM file format is knows about the time sampling and stuff and it can match up the, the variables correctly. Okay. Yeah, so, so you can do it. Um, it's going to be a pain to work it out if you do try and do that. So try and keep separate time frequencies of different files. Oh, I was just wondering if it crashed your model or if it just becomes a big pain for you. Yeah, it, it's fine. It's just a, and it, it, like it's solvable. It's just a pain. Yeah. Um, if you're wanting to set up your own um, spatial domain or time processing, um, that's these extra columns here. Um, so our all feeder levels is set up here. Variable and model feeder levels are ranged from level one to level 85 over the full area, land, sea points. So you can see there's lots of customization you can add for here. Like if you're wanting to output only the Northern hemisphere or specific latitude bands, stuff like that. It's all perfectly doable. Uh, same for time processing. So our six hourly monthly mean is a time mean over, a, meaning over a 30 day period, sampling every six hours, outputting every 30 days. Um, so yeah, you get set up all your own time processing. Unfortunately, because the model's old, um, a lot of these names are pretty garbage. Um, so you just have to try and decipher what these mean from the names, or you can go into this time profile setting and then see what exactly it's trying to do. Um, so that's just like a legacy. That's how the Met Office work. Um, so that's how the models are that we get from them. Um, usage profiles will just be saved to file PP0, which is one of the things defined here. So these are pretty simple. And then we've got the science settings. So, I mean, I'm not a climate scientist, so I can't tell you too much about what all of this does. Um, check the documentation page I pointed to on the Met Office MOSRS track um, for details on all of this. But everything's broken by broken up into different sections, so radiation, bound, boundary layer, convection. Uh, you can change the settings here. There's further details if you drill down. So there's a wide variety of buttons to push if that's what you like to do. If you're just wanting to keep everything standard, that's perfectly fine. That's why the Met Office supply these GA configurations. That means you don't have to set up properly everything. So by default, the model will come with all of these at a useful setting. Um, again, dual site settings. So that'll be for the land surface model. Um, if you're wanting to use the cable land surface, you would have to use one of the access experiments, um, which are set up pretty similarly to this. Um, pretty much the same. It'll just be a slightly older, for, for access CM2, it'll be a slightly older version of this interface. Um, access ESM is a bit of a different story. Um, so we won't cover that here. So we've set up our model. Next thing to do is to run it. And we can just press the play button and that'll start it running. Oops, I've still got it running. So I just need to go in here. 
stop it. So I'm just copying in the command that it told me to run here. Um, so there's no need to write that down. So we will now try and run it. And it just needs to think about it for a moment before it actually stops. Um, so you can just run this in the command line too. It's just running row sweet dash run. Um, just run that in your experiment directory. Uh, will be exactly the same thing as what this is doing. So you don't have to start up the interface just to run the job. Um, so the model runs in a job control system called Silk. Um, it's like a more advanced version of the supercomputer queue. So you can specify dependencies and time cycling and stuff like that. And it then submits jobs into the normal supercomputer queue. Uh, you're thinking about it? Hmm. It's just being slow. So yeah, um, most of the Silk features are really only important for NWP. So if when you're getting in observational data and need to assimilate it into the model run, um, you have much more complex dependencies. Uh, climate jobs tend to just be run the first month, run the second month, run the third month, finished. Um, so yeah, it, it's overkill for the stuff we normally do, um, but it's good to be using the same system as the Bureau use. Um, and the Met Office used for their uh, models. Uh, try running it again in the... Oops. Try running it again in the command line to see if that gets it working. Don't mind me, I'm just trying to make it run for the demonstration just because I had to manually kill it. Um, so yeah, normally you just wait and it'll get there for itself. So we'll see if this starts up. Yeah, this is going to bring up a another graphical window showing the list of tasks that need to be run. So building the model, running the reconfiguration, running the model. Um, while we wait, we may as well jump in and take a look at the output. Um, so the output of the model will all be put on uh, Gardi. It gets put in the silk run. So silk is the uh, runner. So Ro Rose is the editor here and silk is the program that's used to set up all of those dependencies and stuff. Um, that's why it's in the silk run directory. And we'll have our experiment u-ce355. Um, so this is just a link to a directory on my scratch directory. 
So it's not filling up your home directory with all of the outputs. In here, um, you've got the same directories as what's on the um, configuration. So that's all gets copied over. Um, but you also have the work directory is where jobs actually get run. So if we go into work, uh, September, oops, at Moss Main is the actual model. Oops, here we go. Let's finish that. So this is where all the nameless live. So these get automatically generated from the from the editor configuration. So nameless files will be in there. Log files as well. So if your model crashes, it's a good idea to look at the logs to see what happens. Log files are under PE. Um, PE in bed office terms is just processor. So if this is the output from processor zero. This is a, a multi-process model. So we'll get a couple hundred processes. It's only going to save the first one though. So we can go through and look at the logs here. See at the end, it prints out a bit bunch of timing information, files that got written. And then this is the model time stepping. So you can see it got to time step 2160, which is um, October the 1st. So my job submission is actually finished now. Um, so that's this. You can see green jobs are currently running. Gray jobs have completed. Orange jobs um, are yet to submit. Um, there's a couple ways you can view this. You can see a whole graph if we ungroup everything. So this is the dependency tree for our job. So it's going to build the model, set up those extra ancillary files, so the model inputs, run reconfiguration, run the model, and then clean up a bit. Um, there's also this view, which will show for each cycle, so for each month, what jobs are running, what's completed, they're all just different ways to view the same information. Um, you've got a couple options here. You can right click on one of these tasks. Trigger will make that task run now, even if it's already completed. That's generally useful if a job has failed. If a job has failed, it'll turn red. You can view the job logs just from here. will come up with some files. So you might check and see that a file's not where it should be. You can fix that. Right click here and run it. Um, you can also pause the jobs. So you can hold or pause everything. Um, so it won't submit any more jobs once it's done. It has a think about it. So now all of these jobs won't be submitted. They're just marked as held. Release them. So this, this button applies to everything. Or you can do an individual task with the hold and release buttons in the right click menu. Um, if you change a setting in the editor and save it and want it to be applied to a currently running job, um, you have to reload it. So you just use that same command we ran, you did to start the job, um, but we'll say reload and that will update the currently running job with the configuration that we've saved on access, access dev. 
So that command will run and update everything. Um, if a job's already been submitted, um, it won't necessarily get the update. You would have to right click and kill the job and then trigger it again. So kill will stop the job running on Guardi. Okay, so that's running the job. Sorry, that's a bit out of order. Um, can I ask? Can I ask another question? Of course. If you have a failed job, and then you say trigger now, does it trigger only the job, or does it trigger the job and then all its dependencies that didn't run because the job failed? Um, it will trigger all of the dependencies only when the job succeeds. So if you don't want to trigger the, all of the dependencies, you can hold, do a global hold and hold a, hold the rest. Um, but yeah, it's not going to automatically submit anything um, until it actually succeeds. You can force force it to think it succeeded if, if you need. Like if it's a failed job that you don't really care about, say uh, post-processing, copying it somewhere, you can mark it as succeeded manually. Um, so you can override things, um, but it's not going to automatically trigger anything. Okay, last couple minutes, I'm going to show you where the model output is. Uh, that would be under share, data, history data. We've got a bunch of files. Uh, DA are restart dumps. So remember it was outputting restart dumps every 10 days. So we've got one for after 10 days, after 20 days, after 30 days. These PA files are our output streams. So back here, remember, we had our output files here. So we had our PA, PB that we set up in our stash requests. So that's all of these. You can see they're marked, some are marked with months, some are marked with days. It's a bit arbitrary how that works. Um, PM is probably our monthly means, if I had to guess. Um, so PM is monthly, PS will be seasonal, that sort of thing. Uh, these are all in UM format. So it's a special format. We've got a program under tilde access in XCON. Oops. To access apps xconf, xconf. I just have this as an alias, so I don't need to load a module. But we can look at one of these files. And that shows up. Sorry, I'll just. Uh, oh. I didn't put the right path. I hadn't changed directory. Let's just make this a bit bigger. So it's just going to read the file. And we'll have a list of variables on the left here. Maybe. Better to look at restart dump because that's bound to have variables. Yes. So here we got things like U wind, V wind, theta. You can double click and plot it. This is just like a quick view. Um, like you'd use the NC view. And here's our field. Um, if we want to do a specific level, we can middle click on one of the levels, apply and plot data. 
Um, so yeah, it, it can be a bit, uh, the interface can be a bit obtuse, um, but try out middle clicks and stuff like that. So if, if I'm just left clicking here, it'll select multiple values, middle click will select a single, uh, double click to open that variable. Uh, you can save from here to NetCDF. Uh, we can say test.nc, output format, NetCDF, convert. And that's just outputting that one single variable I've selected. we can see here it's called at field 174 which is the orographic roughness just as a net cdf file uh, just because that was the variable i had selected you can select multiple um, another useful tool is iris to net cdf so this is in the conda environment So this will save with a bit more metadata um, and automatically compress it. Um, Iris is a Python library developed by the Met Office for working with UM fields. Um, so if you're wanting to work with the data in Python, um, you can use the li uh, Iris library for that. Uh, this is probably just going to take a while um, just because it's a restart dump and they're quite large. Um, so while we wait on that, were there any questions from anyone as we have reached two o'clock? That's all right. Um, so once again, there's a lot more information on this sort of stuff on the CMS wiki. Um, so you can go here, climate-cms.wikis. Um, I just search Google for climate CMS and that will generally get you there. Um, specific model documentation is on the Met Office website. Um, there's links to that from the wiki. Um, so here is the documentation link, for instance, just in the getting started section. Um, there is some account setup that's required to use the model that I've not gone into here just for the sake of time. Um, you can follow the instructions from the wiki to set all that up or send us an email to the CMS help desk. Um, so assuming that's still running, I think we'll leave it there.